Well, it's language, how it co becomes constructed, I can say. So it's not in particular about language learning, and we will see more about what happens when language, one of these political ideas of language, comes into practice together with labor market initiatives. So, but first, I just want to take you back on some ideas because I'm from Sweden and my research is conducted in Sweden, and I just want to give you some pointers and backdrop to in which setting this research is done. And let's see. In Sweden, traditional labor has always been a solution for welfare's problem. Re regarding which any problem you can think of, labor and work has been one of the key solutions for this. We also went from having labor immigration for work to having refugees, and that also shifted the policy. So from having the regional policies of multiculturalization and cultural diversity, now we have integration policies, mostly focusing on work. So we have gone from having an idea of welfare to having an idea of workfare, connecting activity for refugees to individual compensation in the labor market. We had a high influx of refugees in 2015, and that also resulted in a lot of policy changes after 2015 and 2016 and 17 regarding housing, establishment, residence permits, and etc. And it's in the in the in the afterwards of this time that this research is conducted with focus on establishment and labor market integration. Because one thing that was completely in all of the ideas of policy in Sweden during this time was that all that can shall work. You become integrated by work. In labor market integration is the part of labor that comes, will make you integrated. So we have this establishment program for individuals who come, refugees, with tailored support and efforts. And it's combined with activity to seek employment, and the goal is to quickly learn Swedish, find a job, and become self-supported. When you come as a refugee, you, uh, you will participate in this establishment program. If you are the age of 20 to 66 and you have recently been granted a residence permit as a refugee, person in need of protection, or if you're a family member of a refugee or person in need of protection. So this is not for the Ukrainian refugees that we have now. Most of the time, these activities conduct of civic orientation, validation process, similar to all, all, of, this, all of the measurements that Sonia offered. Swedish for immigrants. It's compulsory since 2018 now as a part of the establishment. Internship, support from uh, Swedish Public Employment Service, and additional things that you can imagine. It could be mentorships, activities, and, or various activities. So, before we go into the case that I'm going to present for you, I, will, I want to present for you a little bit of how the language, the Swedish language, is regarded in the labor market in Sweden. So, key, key research before always states that proficiency in the majority language of the country residence has been widely seen as one of the critical conditions to su successful integration into the labor market and society. This is one of the ideas that circulate in a lot of the societies that it's important to know the language where you live. Several scholars have emphasized the positive effects of language training and documented language skills on immigrants' employability. But some are a little bit more cautious, arguing that maybe not it's not the formal requirements for language proficiency, maybe they're only symbolic. And it remains very uncertain to, if not or how, they increase really immigrants' chances of employment. Studies of, studies of the labor market in Sweden has repeatedly shown that in Sweden we do love formal requirements and we do love documented skills. We w want to have well-developed language skills in Sweden and we want to have real documented formal competencies. And it's been a really important criteria for employment in Sweden. And also, if you have to compare two immigrants to each other, especially for em employment in occupations with lower education, the person with the best spoken Swedish language will be the one chosen. So, that's why it's not a surprise that developing the immigrants' proficiency in the Swedish language has also been one of the focus of multi multiple political efforts. And workplace has been seen as one of the key places to learn the Swedish language. That's why we have several of combined labor market initiatives, like all of these suggestions that Sonia provided with us for us, we combined them in Sweden doing a 40 hour a week activity for these people in the establishment. And we are going to look at one of these cases. It's called Welcome to the Future, and it is the actual name of this labor market initiative. 
It's a labor market initiative that's very local with a local housing company, with the Swedish Public Employment Service, the labor market and adult education administration in the municipality. And it was aimed to help 300 persons in three years to gain employment uh, during the establishment process. It conducted a four phases selection process, introduction, internship, and after that, employment or further education up to two years. And in the introduction phase, you have, for example, vocational training, you have uh, civic orientation, you have Swedish for immigrants, you have internship and mentorship. And then you, the participants go further into internship, you keep, keep having the vocational Swedish training and the Swedish for immigrants for those who were in need. And it ended up being three cohorts, and I follow this with ethnographical methods from April 2017 to December 2020 by shadowing, observations and interviews. So I've been very closely in, involved in relating this labor market initiative. So what were they supposed to work with? Well, gardening, weave bedding, uh, maintenance for faci facilities. These were the, uh, the occupations that were aimed for these persons to get an employment within. The Tarbik group originally were people who had no, no or very little education and no or very little documented skills. I do use the perspective of performativity in my study and I will go through it really quickly just to give you an, an in-check into how this study is conducted. So for me, as an organizational management researcher, the definition of an organization or those of language skills or those of validation arises from social perceptions that change with context. Actors constantly construct an organization or ideas of language skills through their actions and their interpretations of what they themselves or what the others are doing. No? There can be many descriptions, therefore, by one organization, and they will be compared accordingly pragmatic and very aesthetic criteria. So that's why the purpose of this kind of research is to capture and describe practices, especially how ideas will come to practice, ideas of labor market integration, the policy ideas of we have policy that want people to learn the language, we want them to be in joint labor market initiatives. How will these ideas be translated into practice? What happens when people start acting on these political ideas? Well, one thing we know from this perspective is that ideas will change. So going back to the project, the project had a very idealistic beginning. It was aimed to be a project, a labor market initiative for those who were struggling the most in labor market uh, integration. And this is a quote from the beginning in the early times. It says from one of the project managers, we will create opportunities and they will be offered to those who are in the worst position. No bloody checkpoints to show how now we have helped a thousand people. Look how good we are. It's not about us. It's about those who are in the most difficult situation. Those who come here with no education at all. We are in a boom, some say. There's no, there's no problem, many say now. But our analysis show that if nothing is done, many people will be without a job. So this is the idea from this labor market initiative that we will create the jobs or help these people who are the furthest away from the labor market to become integrated in the labor market. But quite quickly, challenges arise because in practice, an idea is not the same. For example, the first cohort of participants, the idea was maybe we can aim this labor market initiative for people who live in our own housing, in the local housing company, so they have the means to pay their rent. But quite quickly, they had to change this idea of the target group, depending on the regulations from the Swedish Public Employment Service. So they have to shift the target group and aim at a target group that was living in the great Gothenburg area, or in the Gothenburg municipality. They have to continue shifting because the first group showed to ha have really good oral language skills, but the writing left behind. So for, before the second cohort, they started their activities. Three classes in Swedish were divided according to level of, and mother tongue support were included and close follow-up meetings were added to the program. And this is the start of a very strong practice that they engage in. When they faced challenges, they shifted. They negotiated with each other, they changed, and they, they tried to all the time meet the needs of these participants to help them to become employed. But even though they trying to shift and meet the needs of the participants, semi-literate participants struggled to reach desired language levels. And as a result, for the cohort three, they required education level they, they raised the required educational level for participants before the cohort three intake, having the intake for people who have an educational background at least from six to nine years of schooling. But at the same time, the idea was for these people to become employed and have employment. So external contractors 
uh, who were offered and also took initiative to be a part of this uh, of this project and wanted to hire people, they start to demand more and more language skills, but also they started to require a Swedish valid driving license to employ the people. So the bar was raising for these people on how to meet employment from the contractors and the entrepreneur side as well. One of the official states, we have learned in Welcome to the Future that the lower the level of education one has, the more difficult it is to learn the language. And the language is the key to be able to move forward. We must find a new way, because as good as SFE courses are, they are designed for people with secondary school education. So we had to create something different. So we partly redesigned the SFE courses and also created different levels, where the criterion is not the level of education, but the level of la language. So we can see that they continue to change and shift, because the, the ideas of how the SFE courses were built did not match the participants' need of educational language training. But also the, ex the expectations started to become more and more focused on language. For example, one of the mentors out in the program where they have the internship stated, the better you know the language, the more we can open the world for you. But then the process starts and the participants want to know, what is the purpose of this? Well, you will learn Swedish and we will be able to tell your potential employer, but you have done internship at Familiebostad and they thought I was really good. So the idea of this project was that this is like a place where you stop, you take part in as a participant, and then you get the experience, you get the references, and you get the language education, and you will move on to a contractor. But what is the right level of speaking Swedish? And what is the necessity? Remember the task that these people were aimed to perform, weed bedding, mowing the lawns, uh, painting stairways. We have a meeting with a contractor and some officials from the local administration and, this, and from the local Hansa company and the Swedish Public, public Employment Service. It was a meeting to match with, with a contractor who wanted to hire these people. And the contractor presents all of these opportunities for the, for the participants if they get chosen. They, they will have like discounts for driving license training and they will have mentorship program. But again, they, all the time they also state that well, we need to have people who speak Swedish, we want to have sp people who speak a certain level of Swedish, we have this formal language requirement that we need people to speak. And in the end, the discussion ends with the contractor just stating, Swedish and a driver's license, that is the must to get a job in our company, and that's it. And then I had a discussion with the same contractor some time after, and he said, if you cannot communicate in a reasonable level, at least you need to absorb information by reading and listening to the teacher. Well, those participants we have phased out, which basically means fired, did not develop the language skills at the level that we had hope. So, how were they testing these language skills? We will see. In the beginning, the focus was on jobs. They must have jobs. The project is starting to reflect that it's very difficult to have, make them have jobs. Today, it's nothing like that. Previously, it was like that because these people had no education, newcomers with broken English. In time, other goals were set, such as teaching them proper Swedish. So you can see that the project, due, due to time, now we're in 2019, starting 2017, more and more the focus becomes the language because the contractors demand language skills for employment. So that's why it becomes more and more important. Um, and, but they were, they, were, um, they were educated, the contractors, before they met the target group. They were educated in target group knowledge. These were people mostly coming from Syria or Eritrea. Uh, they were also educated in what kind of experiences these people have gone through, what kind of traumas they may bear with, and also the asylum process. They were also uh, had agreements about the language levels that were supposed to be accurate according to uh, the matching process in need for the participants, and also the participants' educational backgrounds. But when starting to the hiring practices, the contractors fall back on their regular hiring practice, how they always hire people with interviews and their own judgment and their own ideas of, of skills and education. So we had these in interview settings where there were uh, participants and there were also uh, an official from the Swedish Public and Service Service and me. And the contractors asked how and why a participant had come to Sweden and why they had left their country. When the SBS official later asked for the reason of these intrusive questions, the representative for the contractors answered that it was to make conversation and to gain understanding of the participants' knowledge of Swedish. The questions were, why did you leave your country? Why did you fight in a war? Are you a deserter? 
Are you lazy? Is that why you want to come to Sweden? Have you left your family behind? Who's taking care of them when you have left for greater opportunities? And by those questions, they judged the participants' knowledge of Swedish conversation. And this is the reflection from the contractor after these interviews. Our basic requirement is quite low. In the first group, we expected to meet people speaking Swedish level at sea. It was perhaps a little too ambitious or too naive to think that somebody has a grade in Swedish, that is enough. You probably remember the first group we met was very weak. It was too early in the SFE course. We couldn't even interview them. So they used the regular interview practices when, when checking out if the formal requirements of language skills were set. So they asked them about their huge traumas of their life. There were participants explaining how they've been locked in basements for two years and how their family has paid huge amount of money to help them flee the country and how they ended up going both by boat and by plane and finally ending up in Sweden. And the contractor answered, so you just left your family behind. So in the end, how to overcome these negotiations and conflict regarding a practice of change? Because that was what they were doing. They were all the time changing the practices. And how do we face this issue where we can't find the pragmatic solutions? Well, we changed the target group. <laughs> We didn't really raise the requirements, the project managers say. It was more about tightening up a bit and saying that now we have to do it with language tests. Because if someone is very far from the requirements, then other interventions are needed for that person. And we don't want to waste time for that person either, going through a long process only to discover in the matching stage that it was not the right fit. That was what we adjusted in this round, saying now we're implementing a language test so those who can actually handle it will go through the intervention and those who don't pass the language test may need a different, different intervention. So what is my conclusion? Well, one idea is that the language test is the pragmatic solution to this conflict of the demands of the contractor regarding the target group. But the precise level of language skills required remained ambiguous and therefore open to interpretation. Was it the former requirements? Was it the spoken language? Was it the written language skills? We don't know. No one can say it set clear on that. We just know that they need to speak higher level of Swedish language. We also I conclude a conclusion of the study is that employers' values, norms, and previous hiring practice become a crucial part of constructing the definition of language skills. On the other hand, many participants in the project struggled to meet these requirements. We also realized that the employers, they were only interested in finding the right person for them. So this, this comes with an idea that we need to find the right person for us in our company. But the project's goal of finding employment for the participants, it's changed the definition of who were in the employable participants. So the, the, the means become the end, right? Everybody's going to have a job. That was one of the main, main targets of the of the original project aims. So that becomes the reason why we shift the target group. But also the language test became a classifying tool for participation in the project, which could be seen as problematic because it also contributes to the social exclusion the project initially aimed to overcome. And ideas of language skills or validation, you can choose any political ID, can take precedence over formal requirements. Some people may gain work opportunities even though the requirement has not yet been achieved which can be interpreted as an opportunity to act against discri discriminatory norms and structures, yet. Dis disregarding formal requirements may also create a risk of discrimination and reinforcement of racist prejudice. So, my final words on this presentation is it is important to remember that requirements related to language skills are constructed and reconstructed in the context of social structure, which usually contains both privileges and discriminated practices, intended and unintended. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, we will now take questions from the audience. Okay, I have a question and maybe a couple of quick comments. <clears throat> back when I was a young backpacker in Europe, a friend of mine married a woman in Stockholm and said, would you like to come and visit? So I did. And he took me to a Swedish course. 
And I have to say, that was great. I was very impressed with it. So the first part of the question would be, after all these years, what was the success rate or how, how did that work? Because Sweden was the first country to start doing this. Secondly, a bit of criticism. I moved to Finland, spent most of my life there, and the second language is Swedish, so I took some Swedish courses. And my Swedish-speaking friends didn't really like practicing with me, so I thought, I'll go to Sweden. I have, after all, I passed the test, and I can practice with them. It's their language. Do you think I found anybody who wanted to speak Swedish with me? <laughs> they sometimes would say something like, so nice of you to learn our language so well, and then they would speak in English. Um, <clears throat> a little humor, but true. A friend of mine is a Finland svenska. You know, he, it's his native language. He's a book buyer. So he went over there to a publisher, and he started talking to him. And the guy said, in English, my, it's so nice of you to learn our language. You, you can speak it pretty well, he said, in English. So he said, well, you know, there's 6% of the population speak Swedish. So he said that to another person. The same thing happened. So after that, he just started, when somebody said, you speak our language so well, he started saying, yes, well, I've studied hard, and I, you know, eventually I learned it. So my other question would be, what about when you, people are learning the language and somebody in theory is saying, yeah, we would like somebody to speak Swedish. So they're learning Swedish, but everybody's saying, oh, so nice of you to learn our language in English. And uh, I remember when I was trying to speak it, only I could only speak it with foreigners. There was a Polish woman, and I thought, okay, here's my chance. We were in a cafe, and I was practicing my Swedish. So, so what are you going to do with the society to help these people? Because if they're just learning in school, and then they go to work, and in work they said, yes, well, we need Swedish, but all the colleagues can speak English, and you know, they, they answer in English. So how is that going to work? Thank you. Well, uh, policy-wise, Swedish is written to be very important to know in the labor market, and also we can see from this study that it's a very important skill to have when applying for, applying for a job, at least if you are a low-skilled migrant or have less lower education. Um, why the Swedish for immigrants has been successful, I, it has been successful for some groups, uh, not all groups, that we can see here that these studies show that groups with, uh, that are, for example, semi-literate or illiterate, they struggle to learn a new language, but they first need to learn it in their own language to read and write. Uh, so that it takes more time, learning language is a process. Um, regarding the ideas of policies that you do learn a lot of language through your for your work and for your job. Uh, and I think that is why they're connecting the, the labor market activities so closely to the language training today in the policy-wise. Uh, this project that I observed, they had this idea that they, they had a lot of, lot of languages in the local housing company. So they had this idea that no one should be having the same mother tongue in the same work group. For example, they didn't put two people speaking Arabic in one work group. So they put one person speaking maybe Arabic, one who speaks uh, Swedish, one who speaks English, one who speaks Turkish, one who speaks uh, Sorani. Uh, in the same work group, and then Swedish became the joint uh, language to, to share with each other. Uh, but, you know, it's language and the idea of language is filled with many values and norms. And, uh, so, and uh, the other, you could also argue, why is it problematic that people don't speak Swedish? <laughs> it doesn't have to be problematic uh, uh, either, if they can con converse to together in other languages. So. So we also have a question from the web. Uh, which model, in your personal opinion, is more economically viable for Sweden? Quote unquote, welfare or workfare? And the follow-up question, should the economic logic dominate the moral one? 
Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, regarding the work for welfare, I, I'm afraid we can't choose at the moment. Uh, ideas uh, shift over time, and the, 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 uh, that we ended up in a work fair is, is due to a, long, a lot of policy changes all coming from the 90s. Uh, and I, uh, that's why I also think it's very difficult to compare different uh, society models in that sense. Uh, what we can say that, of course, it's always valuable when, when, when immigrants and refugees get support uh, to integrate in a society, which is a part of the work for ID. The problematic is when it's connected to indiv individual activities, for example, that you have to be active 40 hours a week to gain your compensation, and then you have to leave your, your activity because your children has a school meeting and you have to leave your activity because you have to take care of your children because they're ill, then the, the idea of work for it becomes problematic. Uh, but what works in the end, you know, it's, I think it's on a very individual level. We haven't studied that in that comparison. And the other question was about... Should the economic logic dominate the moral one? <laughs> Should economic lo logic ever dominate anything? <laughs> I think could be the key question in this kind of... Uh, uh, I mean, we're talking about humanity, we're talking about democracy, we're talking about integration. I think uh, the economic logic uh, has few pointers on that. Right. That's, right. But that's my personal opinion. <laughs>